Sapria, is also um, very passionate about field work and studying water. So today she's going to show us about how land use can impact Great Lakes watersheds. So give her a round of applause. Sophia, I will be bringing us back to Earth now. <laughs> and today I'll be talking to you about my thesis work I've completed under the supervision of Dr. Sean Carey and Dr. Scott Ketchison in the Watershed Hydrology Group. Um, my thesis work uh, looks at looking at dissolved organic carbon dynamics within the Spencer Creek watershed. There we go. The Spencer Creek watershed is located in Hamilton, Ontario, and it is a complex ecosystem and network of streams that drains into Hamilton Harbor and ultimately Lake Ontario. Over the past few decades, Lake Ontario water quality has been seen to be deteriorating and a big factor into that is actually changes in land use. So looking at Southern Ontario, Environment Climate Change Canada actually states that 68% of natural wetlands have been actually drained for agricultural and industrial purposes. When we look at the Spencer Creek watershed, um, from data collected in 1978, shown in red, compared to data collected in 2015, we see this distinct change in wetland cover. So collecting data from the Hamilton Stewardship Action Plans, we were able to see what the land use cover of Spencer Creek is now. And we, changed, we delineated this into three separate zones. So the first being wetland dominated, towards the headwaters of Spencer Creek and upstream. Moving downstream, we're entering a more agriculturally dominated area in the center of the watershed. And as we finally move down, we're entering a more residential and urban area. So this brings us to the question of, how does land use type actually influence water quality within Spencer Creek? And the parameters I'm using to determine this are dissolved organic matter, dissolved organic carbon, and the hydrology of the watershed to be able to quantify everything. So dissolved organic matter is a broad term we use to describe organic compounds and macromolecules within water. And there are various components of dissolved organic matter, also known as DOM, such as bacteria, plant residue, humic, and fulvic acids. But the way we quantify this in aqueous systems is by actually measuring dissolved organic carbon, also known as DOC. So we measure dissolved organic matter by measuring the, con the concentration of dissolved organic carbon. Why do we care about dissolved organic carbon? Well, eutrophication and nutrient load, eutrophication as a result of nutrient and phosphorus loading has been well understood within Southern Ontario. But the characterization and quantification of dissolved organic carbon hasn't been well studied, even though it could have equally negative um, implications if neglected. So the first thing about dissolved organic carbon is that it has this iced tea yellow light color that attenuates sunlight. So what this means is that for organisms that are dependent on photosynthesis, it becomes harder for them to get the sunlight they need to create their nutrients. Dissolved organic carbon also enhances trace metal um, solubility. So DOC binds to trace metals, which end up in organisms, which isn't that great for them. And then the availability of DOC also has a similar effect, such as phosphorus loading, because the availability increases primary production and bacteria, phytoplankton, are consuming this bacteria, which in end also leads to eutrophication. So the goal of this study was to overall quantify and characterize the dissolved organic carbon sources in this freshwater ecosystem. And the way I characterize the dissolved organic carbon is through using a technique called fluorescence spectroscopy. So I generated excitation emission matrices, also known as AIMS, and essentially what this is, is you shine light at different increments, five nanometers each, through your water sample, and based on the water sample, it will emit and absorb light at different, it will emit and absorb light differently. So these peaks that you actually see here are where emission and excitation is greatest. So the values that we receive for emission and excitation at these different increments can actually allow us to calculate the indices over here. And these are widely reported in literature, and there are big databases full of them. So basically what these indices are telling us 
are that they tell us the proportion of freshly produced dissolved organic matter compared to old, um, older dissolved organic matter within your study area. You can also look at where the dissolved organic carbon is coming from. Is it terrestrially derived? Is it microbially derived? And the fluorescence index tells us that right here. And lastly, I looked at the index of SUVA 254. So SUVA basically tells us how much carbon, the aromaticity of the carbon content. So which areas in the watershed are showing more complex carbon. So this is my study area um, in Spencer Creek. I had a total of 16 sampling sites for water chemistry. Eight of these sites were actually used for discharge measurements where I measured continuous water stage or level throughout the summer. And three of these sites are Water Survey of Canada sites that had data readily available to download. And for the most exciting part, results, what did I find? So here is a map of my eight discharge sites plus the three Water Survey of Canada sites that I made using ArcGIS. The delineations are based on the watershed boundaries of each sampling point, so all the water that drains to that sampling point. And for this map particularly, for this map particularly, I'm looking at the average DOC concentrations within the watershed. Over here, the scale shows the higher concentrations of DOC are in the darker blue color, whereas the greener color is um, lower, relatively lower concentrations of DOC. So there's three important things I want to note. The high concentrations of DOC were found in the upper to mid region of the watershed. The low concentrations of DOC were found in the more residential areas further down the watershed. And this site upstream actually behaved as a residential site. Um, this is where Valence Conservation Area is located for some of you who might know the local area. And this has been modified by humans in a lot of ways. There's a fake lake there and pretty much um, a lot of new trees have been planted also, so a lot of the time we'll see it behaving like a residential area. Now, where is this DOC coming from? So here is a map of the freshness index, which is telling us the source of DOC. Is it terrestrially derived or microbially derived? The values I found were between 1.34 to 1.66. In the literature, it's described that if you're um, fluorescence index values are ranging between 1.3 and 1.7. That tells you that your source is terrestrially derived, which is telling us that all this dissolved organic matter is actually coming from the decomposition of plants and not bacteria. The next thing I looked at was the freshness index, which compared the age of DOC and DOM. So basically, the Lighter colors are representing regions of older DOM, whereas the darker colors are representing younger DOM. And what I found was that the oldest DOM was found in the agricultural and wetland areas, where the youngest DOM is found in the residential areas from right here. And lastly, looking at SUVA, SUVA is telling us about the aromaticity of the carbon compounds. So we are finding higher aromaticity within the carbon compounds in the agricultural and wetland dominated areas. We're moving downstream, we're seeing less complex carbon structures. So what we found is agricultural and wetland regions are contributing older complex carbon DOM in general. Another factor I considered in my research was dissolved inorganic carbon. So now this incorporates all the inorganic species that we're finding dissolved within water. And we care about this because it also makes up the aqueous carbon balance, and we'll get a better holistic understanding of what that carbon balance is actually like. So to analyze GIC dynamics, I wanted to look at this aqueous carbon balance. So mapping out those concentrations, we see that the highest concentrations are actually taking place closer to the headwaters, and also this one site downstream here. So interestingly enough, this was correlated with stream water temperatures. So looking at those two sites that were found upstream, we see that they're showing colder water stream temperatures with less variability and um, less variability and lower temperatures in general. And we also see that other site that was seen right here downstream as well. And yes, we're seeing less variation and lower stream temperatures. 
and we suppose that this is showing a strong groundwater signal. So in order to investigate that a bit further, I plotted runoff from a site that was located closer to the headwaters that was getting a lot of groundwater recharge compared to a site further downstream that wasn't as groundwater influenced. What I saw was that even during the hottest parts of the summer, that the groundwater influence site had a sustained base flow compared to the surface water influence site almost reached values of zero during the summer and it was a very hot summer. So yes, this shows us that there is a stronger groundwater influence at the site up close to the headwaters compared to a stronger surface water influence downstream. And in fact, it was so hot this summer that one of my sites completely dried up and that's me wondering where all the water went. <laughs> So why are DIC values so high at these sites? Well, this is all controlled by the basic geology within Hamilton. So in Hamilton, we mostly have limestone and dolostone geology, which has a lot of calcium carbonate. And the dissolution and weathering of this bedrock, which you would find by groundwater, which groundwater will also contribute to, will contribute by carbonate ions and carbonate ions within this water. And that will overall increase the amount of DIC you have at those sites. And lastly, looking at proportions of DIC versus DOC to see the aqueous carbon balance, we see that DIC actually plays a bigger role. So it composes majority of the carbon balance compared to DOC, which composes up to about 25% of the carbon balance. So overall, I would like to conclude that from my results, I found that DOC concentrations have been highest in agricultural and wetland dominated regions within the Spencer Creek watershed and lowest in the residential and landscaped areas. The DOC is sourced from terrestrially derived material throughout the watershed. More decomposed, greater carbon structures are found in these wetland and agricultural regions. The DIC concentrations we measured were found to be highest at these groundwater influence sites, which also showed um, lower stream temperatures and are also influenced by local geology. And lastly, DIC composes majority of the aqueous carbon balance. And this is all really important to consider because a lot of the time we're talking about the carbon balance in terms of what's going on in the atmosphere. But part of that carbon balance is also located in water. And it's really important to make sure we're taking that aqueous carbon balance into consideration. And when we add land use factors into it, it's important to understand how dissolved organic carbon is being influenced by various types of land use and what that means in the bigger picture of the story. So I would like to thank my supervisors, Sean and Scott. Sean isn't here, he's on sabbatical in Idaho. But Scott, thank you so much for this entire summer and year. I couldn't have asked for a better supervisor. I'd like to thank the rest of the Watershed Hydrology Group for teaching me how to run the Apple Log, for teaching me how to just work the computers and stuff. I've appreciated the help so, so very much. The Hamilton Conservation Authority and Water Survey of Canada for helping to answer all my annoying questions. Uh, my ISI 4A12 class, thank you so much for your support over these last four years. I wish I could have 15 minutes to tell you why I love you all so much. <laughs> and I teach especially, Carolyn, thank you so much for organizing 4A12 thesis presentations and everything. And that about concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Supriya. We have time for one quick question. Any quick question? Karen? How do you choose your sample sites? Yeah, so what I initially did was I went on ArcGIS and had layers of streams and roads and basically found where the road layer intersected the stream layer so we could sample right off of the road and not be like going on people's properties or areas that we're not allowed to be in. And out of those sites, we picked 24 that were potentially interesting. So of those 24 sites, we had sites that were upstream compared to downstream and in the areas that we were interested in. And we narrowed those 24 sites down into 16 at the end of the day. And we really did want to include the three water survey of Canada sites so we could have that data available. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you.
Okay. <laughs> <laughs>